Okay, we're st recording. Welcome to The Syndicate, the podcast about the investors behind the overnight successes. It takes years, it takes money. And we're very fortunate here on The Syndicate that we get to speak to some of the most interesting angels, investors, and entrepreneurs. And today we have a wonderful interview lined up with our own Matt Ward. Matt, you've been in this game for a long, long time, but most of our listeners don't really know very much about you. Where were you born? How did you get started? Well, this is awkward to be on the other side. So Matthew volunteered to interview me, and it looks like that's what we're doing. I, Syracuse, New York, family moved to Atlanta when I was 15-ish. And you could have done so many things in Atlanta. You chose uh, to go off to uh, university and focus on, I believe, computer sciences. What made that choice? Why did you choose that? So I was good at math and science. So I, it was actually mechanical engineering, essentially the same deal. But I, that's what I was good at. That's what my dad did. And of course, engineering is a great job, or at least it used to be. It kind of seems to have gone a little bit away from that. But I like solving problems. Engineering was solving problems. The problem was when you're doing that for someone else in a big company, you're solving the same shitty little problem every day. And that was blow my brains out boring. So that's how I got into startups. That's such an interesting story. I, uh, I was first taken with being an aerospace uh, engineer, an aeronautical engineer, until I actually interned and discovered you don't get to design spitfires and hurricanes. You only get to design the, the wingtips. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, what was the first thing that you sat down and uh, you know, uh, put paper to pencil around in terms of inventing or creating that first thing when you were at high school or earlier? Oh, so the, the first thing would be in college. So it was awesome. We had a we had a robotics class. It wasn't a robotics class, but the project was robotics. And essentially, we had to build a fire rescue robot to compete against all of the other robots. Hmm. So you have people out in a forest, you need to save them. And it was all simulated with different things and ping pong balls and all of that. And then we had to compete in a, a round robin type thing. Our team did really well because we realized that by messing with the other teams and preventing them from saving lives, we were able to boost our score. So we got pretty far along until the teachers thought that that wasn't fair. And do you still do that type of inventing? Do you still tinker around with, with physical objects? Not as much as I would like to. So before, before the syndicate and before starting uh, the business after that, I was into crowdfunding. I built the top crowdfunding podcast, which turned out as a terrible business model, because if you want to raise money, then people don't have jack to pay you with. But I was looking into how can I create my own products, and I was looking at some different options. I designed a laptop case that opened up into a standing desk. I went to China for that. Prior to that, I was working on a magnetic attachment for a bike rack to go on top of your car. It didn't totally work, and I launched some bikes off the top of our cars during the summer. So that was, uh, that was interesting, but I haven't done that as much lately. Right, and, and I'm assuming not all of those things went well. well. What did you learn? What did you learn from those early experiments, putting, you know, trying to be innovative, trying to create things? It's really hard, and even once you have a product or an idea, the process of taking that to market is significantly more challenging than you would think. So, A, you need the idea, but the idea doesn't really matter. You need something that you're going to be able to sell, and then you have to build something. So I was trying to design products from the ground up, which can go really well in that it's differentiated, but it can also take forever. So having the, the insight to know what to build is very, very important. And I, if I had gone further along with some of the things I was looking at, I think those could have been successful, but they wouldn't have been hugely successful. They would have been niche little Kickstarter projects. Got it, got it. Well, I want to talk a little bit about Kickstarter and crowdfunding. And in fact, we're going to talk a little bit about the art of the Kickstart, the Syndicate, and of course, the upcoming book, Gods of the Valley, on this uh, podcast today. But just going back to art of the kickstart, you know, in, in, the, in the world of publishing and innovation, you've, you've figured it out a number of times, and you've actually built the right product at the right time. Art of the kickstart was the most highly trafficked of the early crowdfunding sites. What gave you the spark to put that together and really launch it? So my, I, I got very into podcasts. So from interning as well, I was working at Airbus in Hamburg. And I found out fast that it was incredibly boring. Everything I was doing was CAD. 
I had friends, they would listen to music. And I discovered, you know, if I'm doing CAD stuff, I can listen to whatever I want. I started listening to Sherlock Holmes, other books on tape. I told friends about it and they were like, Jesus, that's freaking in. That, that they loved it. They found podcasts, podcasts from there. I was like, shit, I can listen to business and I can learn while I'm actually doing mindless work, getting paid three euros an hour, which is like slave labor. So from that, I got into e-commerce. I learned a lot about e-commerce and podcasts really changed my life. They showed me an opportunity to travel the world, build a business on my own. It's uh, the digital nomad type thing. I did that for quite a while. It, it worked out well, but Art of the Kickstart was actually my second podcast. My first co podcast was called Business and Bootstrapping. And that was a terrible idea because there was there was no niche. There's two types of businesses. There's bootstrapped ones and there's VC ones. And when you're going for at least 80% of the market, it means you're not really talking to anyone. So from that, I realized, okay, this is not going anywhere. I need to be significantly more specific. I want to build a podcast so I can build an audience, then build a business around that. So I looked at, okay, what's interesting? Well, Kickstarter, that's kind of interesting. Crowdfunding, and that this was 2013, 2014. It was really starting. There had been a couple of big campaigns, but it wasn't much. So really, I just I hustled my face off. I got all of the top projects. I more or less was like, hey, you're kind of awesome. I want to help you sell more product. What do you think? And most people are going to say yes to something like that. So it was a combination of getting great projects and then trying to make it as actionable and valuable as possible. Because when you're trying to raise money, you're looking for all the free help you can get. So that's kind of why it took off was timing, content, and a little bit of hustle. Good. And so obviously, out of the kickstart, at some point, you decided to sell that one and move on. And here you are. I don't know. If, I, I know that you have more than one podcast live right now. But the one that I'm most familiar with and that I listen to is the syndicate. And I'm curious, what made you do it again? And what did you change? So obviously, you learned a lot in those first 10 years, but now you, do, you continue to do it. Uh, what have you really learned? What are the best practices here? Oh, God, if that was 10 years, I would look much worse than this. But uh, so I, had, I saw that crowdfunding was something that could work. That's when I realized that I had to do something myself, though. Helping other people build their businesses was not a great way to build a scalable business. It was a great way to build an agency. And I'm way too ADD and I'm not a managing person in that way. So I was like, okay, what do I do? I had a friend tell me, we should kickstart your own product. That's when I got into building a standing desk, a laptop case that opened up into a standing desk. I moved to China. I'd been in Thailand and Vietnam at the time to get designs made. So fast forward, it takes around three weeks between me submitting CAD files and the factory I was working with submitting a final prototype so that we can go through. And then from that prototype, you need to iterate and iterate and iterate. I, I go really fast. You can tell just by how I talk. I'm very ADD. So I knew other people that were selling products online. They were doing a really good job just manufacturing and using Amazon. I figured if these guys can do it, these idiots can do it. So can I. So I got into, I got into Amazon. I started manufacturing home and garden products. And the business just took off. So it ate all of my time. Art of the Kickstart was gone. The, the, uh, the, 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 the well, whatever I was trying to say, the, the laptop case was gone. Everything else was gone because suddenly I was making money. And shit, as someone who needs to make money, that's what we focus on. So we became the gardening guy. I built a podcast around that FBA All-Stars, which was, here's how I'm hacking Amazon and selling product and doing a pretty decent job with it. I came up with a tagline of step one to I don't, Jesus, I don't remember. It was something about selling the business for seven figures at the end of a year. It's like eight thousand dollars to seven figures. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I invested eight grand. I didn't have a lot of money, yeah. but I, I came up with a, a, an impossible tagline because that would make the podcast exciting. And then somewhere along the way, I decided I should probably try to do this. I was reinvesting a hundred percent of the money into the business. I was living in Thailand and Vietnam off of a thousand bucks a month, so I was saving. Plenty of money. And then I was using FBA All-Stars, which this podcast went even better than Art of the Kickstart. And this one's actually where people have businesses. So if they have businesses, then they derive value. And I was able to refer software I was using that was helping me run my business better to others. And that was able to offset all my costs. So consulting, some affiliate stuff. I wrote a book on copywriting. And I was making plenty of money from that so I could reinvest 100% into the business. Fast forward. I sell the business at the end of the year. I hit my goals. I was very surprised. And then a year of transition. But the entire business, I'm not a, I'm not a gardening person. My goal was, I wrote a blog post. And it, the title was, 
I want to make a fuck ton of money so I can be a good person. And the, the idea was I want to have the money so I can focus on the things that actually matter, the ideas that matter, the people that matter. And for me, that's startups, that's innovation. I think that's where, that's where change and the future come from. So that's really why I got into the syndicate. I was angel investing right. because, to be honest, I like working with early stage companies. That was my goal to become a, a larger scale angel investor. And I was using the money from selling the business, using the syndicate to build the network, meet awesome people like you, Tim O'Reilly, Gil Pancina, et cetera, and build deal flow. So that's kind of where the syndicate came in. And then investors are able to invest alongside me in our syndicate, which if you're listening, you can apply the syndicate.vc slash join. Yes, and we're, we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. But I just wanna finish off this thread around your podcasting experience because you know, I, I uh, and I think you've already explained that the focus and the audience has shifted over time. Um, what, are, what are the best practices? I mean, if, you, if, you were, if someone was starting out right now with a podcast, what two or three pieces of advice would you give them? Number one, you're not going to make money from the podcast. If you think about it as a way to make money, it's a terrible idea. It's, the podcast is one of two things. It's lead generation or it's a great way to meet people. It's a way to build yourself up as a thought leader and get into the industry that you want to get into. I wasn't an incredibly accomplished angel investor when I got started. I was an average Joe that wanted to meet some of the smartest people. And I had a lot of experience with business. I've consulted at, at this point dozens, if not hundreds of companies a lot of them being e-commerce companies, but my expertise is network effects and growth hacking. But right. I've always liked podcasts because you can learn really quickly. I've listened, I, I mean, I've probably listened to 10,000 hours at this point of different podcasts because I think it's a great way when you're not around the right people to up your average, that average of the five closest people. So the podcast, I would say the most important thing is to realize you're not going to make money. Yep. Then the second most important thing is to know, okay, so what's your goal going to be? and to optimize towards that. And then the third is, for God's sakes, whatever you're doing, build a list or something outside of the podcast itself so that you have something other than the platforms that you're building on. So with Amazon, with other platforms I've built things on, you see the issues of building on a platform where suddenly you're playing on someone else's playground and you can lose access to the slide and then it's not that fun. Yes, so let's, let's move on to the syndicate because as you mentioned, it's sort of where the focus of your activity is now. Um, you have a podcast, you have an angel list syndicate or a, a equivalent syndicate where you show interesting companies to the people that follow you. Um, and as you've already said, uh, it's all about supporting those entrepreneurs and getting them the resources they need and being an angel in the process. Um, why did you choose that particular format? So, you know, within the world of early stage investing, there are angel groups, angel networks, crowdfunding uh, platforms and syndicates. There's, a, there's incubators, accelerators. So there's a lot of ways to play. And obviously, I can see why your podcast history might have taken you down this path. But tell us, why have you chosen this particular format to uh, do your angel investing? If I get on a teeter-totter with someone that weighs 300 pounds, I'm losing every time. <laughs> I do not have the the economic weight to be able to throw around to be a large scale investor that people take seriously. That's, that's just the ins and outs of it. And to make the economics work better for me to be able to negotiate better deals. And I like the fact with syndicates that you're able to not just get better deals, but leverage the network. So when you have a large network of connected people that all want to see this company succeed, then you essentially have an army that's willing to do introductions, that's willing to help you out with hiring, all of that good stuff. And I wanted to build something that's at least pseudo proprietary. So joining an angel network, that costs money. You've gotta be able to cut big checks. Investing in crowd equity sites, that typically you're not getting the, the cream of the crop. And again, there's not a lot of leverage. With a syndicate, we can build something very meaningful, which let's, to, to be honest, most people that are running syndicates are running them because ultimately they wanna build up a track record, they wanna build up L LPs and they wanna raise a fund. And I'm not going to say that's not somewhere on my horizon in terms of where I would like to get to. I'm definitely not at that point today. But that's kind of what I'm doing. And also just to democratize access. I think, right. I think angel investing, early stage companies, tech, is one of the best ways not only to make money, but to further the future. I'm actually writing an article now. on It's on blockchain and the, the stock market, so to speak. 
but the title is Li liquidity kind of sucks. And the problem is when you're looking too short term, then you don't really create something larger scale because you're really worried about, oh my God, the public market, what if our quarter ratings go down? Maybe if I should just fire people instead of building a business because then our overhead is lower so our ratios look better and yada, yada, yada. I like to focus on people that are building the future, not people that are bitching about the small scale things. Yes, so, um, so I'm imagining that, uh, you know, the, well, why don't you just explain for a minute exactly how the syndicate works? Uh, so the audience sort of understands what we're talking about. So if you're investing, there's essentially three ways to do it. As an individual, via a syndicate or an SPV, which is a special purpose vehicle, which is come to us courtesy of the Jobs Act, or through a venture capital firm. A VC firm, you're going to put in at probably minimum $100,000. You're going to have to put in a decent amount of money to invest with a firm. They're going to charge you 2% management fees and 20% carry. Carry is the difference between what you invest over what you return. So let's say the fund invests $100,000 and returns $300,000. The difference is $200,000. 20% of $200,000 is $20 million, which goes to the fund, and the remainder goes to the investors. How a syndicate works is it's kind of like a fund, but it's on an opt-in basis. So rather than giving up control to someone else, you have control to pick the companies that you're investing in. You see our deal flow, the companies we're looking at, and you're able to invest with us. Then there's carry on individual deals. It's, just, it's the same. We modulate between 10 to 20%, depending on the deal, depending upon the demand. But it's something in that neighborhood, and there's no fees. So you get to see what we're looking at and invest if you want to. The, the reason I like the syndicate model is it's much more aligned with incentives. And there's liquidity faster. So one of the big problems LPs have or funds have is, OK, we've got a fund, and shit, we're waiting for Uber. We can't cash out because Uber is everything for us, and it's still going and going and going. Syndicate. Every single deal is, has different liquidity events, which means that maybe you get your money back after a year, three years, 10 years, so that you don't have to wait until the very end of the fund life cycle to get some distributions. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, you can find it's the syndicate at your domain, but do you also find, have you taken your syndicate to AngelList or Cedars or other crowdfunding platforms? Right now we don't use AngelList, so one of, one of the things I'm a big proponent of, and I've seen a lot, is when you build on someone else's platform, you're subject to challenges that you may have with said individuals if they want to kick you off of the playground. So it's not something that we won't do, but there's some extra fees that go into there. There's some extra carry that's paid to AngelList. And right now, we've decided to run our syndicate off of AngelList. So we do it similar to how Calicanus runs his, Jason Calicanus. We do everything via email. We use type forms to be able to input in how in much interest there is, send out memos, et cetera. So then everything's kept proprietary between our team okay, and got our it. investors. OK, and if someone does sign up for your syndicate, uh, is there any industry or geographic or stage focus to the comp type of companies you're putting up? Yeah, so typically we like North America and Europe just because those are the ones we're both most able to evaluate. In terms of industries, we look at a, a pretty wide range, so my background Essentially, I like to evaluate things that I think are going up that I think I can evaluate and add value to. So e-commerce, e AI, automation, robotics, those kind of all lump together. We look to look at those. Blockchain we'll look at, but not ICOs. I think ICOs are incredibly frothy at this point. IoT we like, but there has to be a SaaS recurring model because otherwise you're selling an iPhone and you have to slow it down to get the next model out. Let's see, what other, there's a couple of other industries. Obviously, B2B SaaS. I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but at the same time, I think SaaS is, I think it's beyond the, the 30 to 50% kind of threshold of where the ultimate gains are. So SaaS software is eating the future. We've heard that plenty of times, but I think software ate a lot of the past, but I'm not sure how much of the future it's gonna be versus other more competitive technologies. AI alone, I don't think, is a great investment, just because everything is AI these days. You really need to have something differentiated. And then we typically don't do a lot of B2C, especially not B2C hardware. Those would be the, those would be the primaries. But if you go to the syndicate.vc slash thesis, T-H-E-S-I-S, you can see a little bit more about us, the companies we've invested in, why we invested, and our focuses. Now, stage-wise, we like to do before Series A, so pre-seed, seed, potentially a Series A, but that would be much more on a follow-on basis, just because, again, when you're on that uh, teeter-totter with the heavy guy, you're not getting anywhere. 
So if you're competing against large firms with tons of money, you're not getting much equity. Got it. Thanks, Santa. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, on your own podcasts, you've interviewed many of the leading early stage investors across formats. So you've had, you know, people like Gil Pencino and Luke Kerner who are running their own syndicates and are angel investors. You've had people like uh, Adam Draper of Boost VC, who's more of a, in the VC mindset. You've had people like uh, Esther Dyson and Tim O'Reilly, who are more, we think of as thought leaders, but looking for companies that really can meet the future that they're painting. Um, and then you've had people like Ted Sabinski, who, you know, tech stars sort of operating incubators and accelerators. So across all of those different parts of the ecosystem, what you always ask them the same question. At some point, you always ask them, what's the best practices? What are the things they've uh, seen that make them good at what they do? And I'm curious, how, which are the key best practices, if you will, the best practices of the best practices that you've baked into the syndicate? I would say one of the ones is just have some type of filter. So there's a lot of deals that are coming in for us and for other firms, et cetera. If you don't have a filter, you're going to get bogged down. If you try to be overly opportunistic without running things through a system, you're going to make mistakes. If you don't vet things with other people that are, you don't need consensus. I think consensus can be a weakness because when there's consensus, then it's not contrary. And if there's consensus, everyone's investing in it. If it's consensus, you're not going to make very much money. Um, in terms of other things I like to try to keep in mind, and I'm not always the best at, keep in mind that you're not the smartest person in the room. You're not very good at this. You need to see what other people are thinking, but then not just follow people blindly. I think there's a lot of group mindset when it comes to investing. Oh, we need someone to invest first. And then, oh my God, Andreessen's in, we're all in. Well, Andreessen probably jacked the price up way too much to begin with, but there's plenty of other issues that I think along those lines. I think it, for us, it really comes down to the founder and, for me personally, and for everyone I've talked to, entrepreneurship's a roller coaster. You're kind of going to get put punched in the gut, and you're going to fall over and bleed and have your teeth on the ground. And the question is how many times you can keep getting back up. People that have the grit and the hustle, which I'm, I'll admit something I don't have right now to be a startup founder, but people that have that combined with an intelligence and a little bit of humbleness. Not too humble, because you got to be a little bit of an asshole to succeed. But people that have that right mixture, I think, are the ones that pass my filter. And then check references. Always, let, never the ones that people give you. Just find random references on LinkedIn of people they've worked with. Yes. Well, those are great thoughts, and uh, thank you for that. Um, I think when you interviewed me, you know, I explained that uh, I also have had that sort of history of looking at the different formats. Today, I helped run Koretsu, which Randy Williams founded, but which is the largest of the angel networks, if you will, the traditional angel networks. And I think everything you just said, would, we would res resonate with too, um, in terms of you know how we operate and how we try and make sure that uh, we navigate through a lot of pitfalls. And there are a lot of pitfalls and a lot of failure in this space. Um, which of the deals that you really, really were passionate about um, which is the one where the failure hurt the most? I would say that our, our portfolio is not old enough to have a set failure. I would say more of the failures would just be with myself personally and some of the first deals I did. Not, I think it's important to look through enough deals before you decide to make an investment, regardless of whether you find the next Uber or Facebook or you think you do, because it's always you think you do. I would wait until you've looked at a certain number of deals, probably at least 20 to 40, to be able to better evaluate. There are one or two companies in my portfolio, personally, that I would not make that investment a second time. But that is kind of how it works. OK, so do you want to talk about one specific story um, from your past, the failure, and what you learned from it? I don't want to reference a specific company, but I didn't spend enough time talking to the founder. Right. and have since had a lot of trouble in terms of staying in touch and following progress. So my goal as an angel investor, I'm not going to be the biggest angel investor, but I'm going to try to be the most helpful. And I think that that's incredibly important, especially given my background and what I'm good at. 
I can generally be pretty helpful. A nice thing about the syndicate is it's also a little bit of a hack. I put together an entire database of everyone we talk to and everyone else in my network so that I can connect entrepreneurs as needed because everyone needs follow-on funding. But I think looking at, looking at an opportunity without evaluating the market size or the founder well enough was the biggest mistake that I made. Yes. Today. Yeah, actually, we, we, it's a very good point. Uh, what we tend to see is first-time entrepreneurs often think they're trying to raise capital. But by the time you get to the serial entrepreneurs who are on to their third, fourth, or fifth start, they understand that the angels are actually bringing knowledge, expertise, relationships, resources, a lot of other things. And um, we often find what you just described, which is the the first time entrepreneurs aren't very easy to contact and speak with, and they're not really looking for help. But by the time you've got serial entrepreneurs, you know, angels are much more active and hopefully you're adding a lot of value. All right. So let's advocate though. At that point, they might have the money where they're not entirely super motivated to keep doing this. It's kind of, let's try it, but it's not like, Jesus, this is tuna and ramen money. Otherwise we're screwed. There's some truth to that too. But um, so let's move on from the syndicate. I want to talk about a couple of other topics. And one of them is something you've already referenced, which is your travel lust, that you've lived in all these different places, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, um, you know, Spain, and here you are right now in Switzerland. And so just tell, tell your audience, you know, why are you in Switzerland? What, what's brought you there? So I'll run through the background pretty quick. So I was in Southeast Asia, more or less the reason being it was a digital nomad hub. It was super cheap. It was super beautiful. It was super different. And probably most importantly, there were tons of online entrepreneurs. So there are tons of other people just like me. I'd be working in a co-working space with 20 to 50 different entrepreneurs, freelancers, people that all had their own gig and their own story, which is very important for me because you can meet incredibly interesting people and you can learn a lot from them. So that was really valuable for me from sure. there. What I found is these type of people, at least the type of person I was for quite a while, they travel a lot. They have opinions. So I would ask people, where's the best place you've been? Where's your favorite place? And consistently what would come up would be Colombia, uh, South America, Medellin specifically. It's absolutely beautiful. So I decide, okay, you know what? Screw it. Let's do it. I go to the U.S. because I've been in Southeast Asia for 15 months to see the family a little bit. I head back to the States. Then I fly to Colombia. In Colombia, I meet my now wife, who is Swiss, so everyone likes to joke, oh my God, you went to Colombia and came back with a Swiss girl. How in God's name does that happen? So that right. kind of explains how we got to Switzerland. We spent some time in Europe. Spain, Barcelona was very nice. We spent some time in South Africa. And now we're in Switzerland because Donald Trump is really friendly with letting in immigrants, and it turns out Switzerland must be one of those shithole countries. So we're going through the process of filling out the green card and moving to Toronto in four weeks. Ah, I see. So you're on your way back to North America. Exactly. So um, that's interesting. About half of your uh, podcasts recently have included blockchain, crypto, or ICO in the title or in the content. And, uh, you know, I, I know that Switzerland and Zug specifically has set itself up as being one of the most friendly pro crypto, pro distributed parts of the world in terms of where to create your company launch your ICO and so on. Um, have you learned anything being in Switzerland about you know blockchain and crypto and the Swiss view of those things? I think it's interesting. So Switzerland's a country, Switzerland's a country like a bank. They want to go up with an insurance with an interest rate and they just never want anything to go down in more or less everything that they do. But Switzerland specifically has put a lot of money and emphasis on blockchain because they're scared shitless about what's going to happen to banks if they're disintermediated. So they're trying to pour their money into saving themselves and becoming the future. I would say that there's a lot going on in terms of crypto speculation. There's a decent bit going on in terms of startups, but a lot of it's a, it's not as much as you would think. And the reason being, Switzerland is the most expensive country on earth. It's not a good place to build a startup from. So a lot of companies are basing their foundations here, but they're actually basing their team somewhere else. And that's where the, the hardcore work is happening. And the reason they're basing it here is for tax reasons, for regulatory reasons, et cetera. So Toronto is also supposed to be pretty solid for, for blockchain. I'm excited about that. But I would say the majority of the blockchain, the majority of my learnings and the majority of the focus I've taken in has been from podcasts and from bloggers and other thought leaders in the space. 
because it hasn't been as much local. There's some pretty large meetups, but the meetups, I would say a, a large percentage of them or a large percentage of the people are more focused on how do I make money investing, not how do I build the future. Right. So you already said that um, you see the ICO market as frothy um, at the okay. same time. But at the same time, you know, the, uh, here in North America, the angel movement, all angels invested about 24 billion last year, but only about eight of that, eight billion of that was in the formative and seed stages. And already in last year, ICOs, some people believe it was around six billion. And right now the run rate appears to be somewhere between one and one and a half billion dollars per month. So if that, if that keeps up, and it may not, but if it does, we could see by the end of this year that uh, ICOs and distributed crowdfunding techniques have raised as much as the entire angel movement, which has been around for decades, um, you know, raises in a typical year. Um, do you, how, you know, your, your, your passion for angel investing, your focus on your syndicate, and yet you're not, you say you're not yet focused on ICOs. Do you expect that's going to change? Do you think this, the syndicate will share ICOs? Or is that something that you're, you're just not going to go there and you're going to focus on, if you will, equity-based syndication? I would say I like to be opportunistic. So I'm in the process of advising a company, a blockchain-based payments company that's going to be doing an ICO later on. They're doing an equity round first. In my opinion, any company that's raising an ICO that hasn't done an equity round first is pretty much a shit project. So mm -hmm. for the most part, they couldn't attract the the more experienced investors and they're going for the easy money. Not necessarily that it's a scam, but it, that it's a team that probably doesn't deserve the funding that they couldn't get. And I, th I don't see that changing anytime soon. Now, it's getting cleaner, the market's getting better, it's starting to self-regulate a little bit, the rounds are getting smaller, but at the same time, it's still super, super frothy. I think most of the projects that we're seeing now have no business being a, a token in terms of they're only setting up a utility token to get around securities law, which ultimately is not sustainable. The reason why they're raising so much money and having so little cost associated with it is only because they're breaking all of the laws that are associated with securities. Once that gets sorted out, I think the majority of these blockchain projects are going to be categorized as securities with a smaller percentage being on utility. And when that happens, then I see less funding going in to more quality projects because it'll be less of a land grab, a cash grab. Now, yeah. blockchain, it's incredibly interesting because not only is it potentially reinventing the internet, but it's potentially reinventing society and governance. So, I mean, if you take away money and you take away governance or trust, which are the two things that blockchain are pretty damn good at, then I don't see a huge purpose for government other than pointing a gun at your head. So it creates some very interesting dynamics in how the world is going to change. I don't know how that will play out. I know in chaos, there's always huge opportunities. So it's not something that I'm averse to, but it's something where I would prefer to invest in equity prior to investing in ICO. I think the only way to make money right now in ICOs is to know the right people, be on the inside and be flipping ICOs. I hear a lot of people talking about, yeah, we can get in early and then we can sell it right when it goes live for 2x. And in my opinion, that's not a sustainable system. That's arbitrage, which is nothing different than a stock trader. And they create zero value in the world. They just arbitrage value from others. So yes, very good thoughts. And uh, I think that uh, sentiments which many of us agree with and hold, it's, it's back to what you said earlier on. Um, we, we know that when you back a startup, it's an idea, it's a team, but it's also a business that needs to be built. And right now, people are raising a lot of capital where the investors have never even met the entrepreneur and don't know if there's the capability to build the business. And, uh, you know, I would say more of our startups fail because something goes wrong in building out the business than the, the idea was a bad idea at the genesis. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got the same idea. And then with blockchain specifically, there's, I mean, how many, how many networks has Dan Larimer founded? I think he's on his third billion dollar plus one. If you're founding something and then leaving and just cashing out, it's never going to work because that's like giving birth and then leaving the baby somewhere. Right, right. yes. Uh, though, though we also do see serial entrepreneurs who sometimes are good at founding things, 
but not very good at building things. So that, but I hear your point, which is when he's, when he's. The founder doesn't get paid though. There's not like, I'm yeah. going to start a business and then hand it to someone else and I'm going to take 20% of whatever this future business becomes. Yes. And in fact, probably hold on to a lion's share of the tokens too. Yeah. Um, okay, so so in that last interchange, something came up which I did want to ask you about, which is your views on politics, governments, and so on. Um, it tends to flow through a lot of your podcasts, and I wouldn't say you ever say anything positive about governments. So tell us a little bit about your politics, where you're coming from, and uh, you know what 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 is it in your history that's given you this view of governments and how they work. It's just, it's just the inefficiency. So I grew up in the U.S. and I definitely grew up more, I definitely grew up more socialist than capitalist initially. Now I've since changed a bit from that, but I think I, I'm very much, people like to define themselves one way or another. And I think I come down on different places on pretty much every different topic. I like to be thoughtful in how I think of different social issues. Now government specifically, I think the idea that you're born somewhere and then have, at least with the U.S. is concerned, handcuffs tax-wise in terms of your entire life makes no sense. It should not be based off of where you're born. There's very, very little value or importance, and yet people are stuck with these things. There's a, there's a really famous American quote, and it's, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I flip the quote. Ask not what you can do for your country, but your country can do for you. And if it's doing jack shit, get out and go somewhere else. That's why I went to Southeast Asia. It was cheaper, it was better, it worked for me. In my opinion, the US is doing a lot of things that are incredibly bad ideas, including starting a trade war. But government, there's so much corruption, there's so much paperwork. One of the biggest things I've seen is government's purpose seems to be to make government bigger and to have more paperwork. And all of the people that I would consider to be good leaders, I can't think of any that are politicians because politicians are kind of, I mean, if you become a politician, you ultimately become the scum of the earth to some extent. And I, I know that's a bit of a hyperbole, but I think in most instances, it's pretty true. If you look at what you have to do to get to the highest rungs, it's usually not good. So there's something in what you just said that I resonate with, and it's this just this simple formula of, I live in America, I am American. It's the most affluent country in the world. Um, and yet we have amongst the highest taxes in the world. And yet we don't have the best services in the world. And that- they're closer, they're closer to like lower than average. Yes, exactly. And so that equation isn't working. And I, I don't know why, I assume it is inefficiency because you know we don't get the best education, health, welfare, transportation, et cetera. The, the fundamental uh, services that government provides are not the best in the world. We obviously have the best military in the world, which is a different point, but uh, we certainly have amongst the highest taxes and we should have the absolute, the absolute largest um, uh, uh, tax raising capability. Uh, we also have a lot of debt that we have to Finance. So there is that piece of the equation too. Okay, let's move on to something more positive, your new book. So I, for the first time, wrote a book after many years, last year, two of them. Um, one of them was around angel investing, build your fortune in the fifth era, um, which was about how to get into angel investing. Uh, but the other book sounds very similar to your book. Um, I looked at Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft, and tried to figure out with my co-author, Alison Davis, how they go about corporate innovation. And that book, Corporate Innovation, um, is available on Amazon. Your new book, Gods of the Valley, appears to do something similar. You're looking at Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook, and I assume you're taking some best practices or you're, you're, you're you know, gathering some insights from those companies. Tell us about the book, uh, what's its thesis, when, when can we expect to see it and read it? It's basically done. I'm finalizing the testimonials from some pretty interesting people, and we'll be publishing that probably before this goes live. So the reason I wrote the book, I had no intention of writing a book. I thought it could be an interesting thought experiment to take GAFA, the big four, and 
just give each of them a grade, compare them to each other. Very rarely, if ever, have I seen that done. And I thought it could be interesting because, yeah, sure, if you're taking all of them out of context compared to everyone else, they're probably all A's. But at the same time, they're not all A's. There's very, very large differences between the companies. So I more or less thought about it as a thought experiment. Let's go through the companies. Let's break down what's good, what's bad, where are they headed, what are the focuses they should be heading on, uh -huh. and what are the likely acquisitions. So that cool. it kind of breaks down into a report of if you're, if you're Bezos, if you're Zuckerberg, here's kind of a plan. Here's what you need to fix, and here's what you should do. And if you're an entrepreneur on the outside, it's here's what the big boys are probably going to be do doing. So make sure that you plan ahead so you don't get blindsided. Fantastic. Sounds fascinating. And uh, can you give us a little bit of a hint? You know, what, what of the four, you know, can you say something about, uh, let's, you know, again, what, what do they each need to do better? So can you give us an example of one thing for each company where you feel they were getting an E or at least the lowest score? I think 86.5% of Google's revenue comes from advertising, 60% of that from search ads. They yes. might have trouble as we go into a voice-based future because I don't want Alexa or Google now reading me ad after ad after ad. So Google has some interesting problems ahead. They've got some very interesting opportunities as well. Amazon, in a lot of ways, is in God mode. Bezos is doing incredibly well. They could be better. Regulation could be a big threat. But at the same time, Amazon has some really interesting growth opportunities. Apple, personally, I think has peaked. They have some, they have some major challenges with their business model. Sure, they're worth a ton of money, but in my opinion, you can kind of only uh, you can kind of only mistreat. A, you, you can only beat your wife so many times before she leaves, and uh, obviously, that's a kind of controversial yeah. thing to say. But in terms of how how exploitative it is, and then yeah. Facebook has some interesting challenges as well. Now they've diversified a bit, but there's a there's a pretty big backlash against Facebook in terms yeah. of how it is for your health and how it is for your mind. And apparently Putin's pretty good at it. Yes, it's fascinating, isn't it? We are time after time. If you, if you look at the, the most successful companies of any given decade and you, you roll that up over the last years, it turns out the companies of the last decade frequently lose one of their number as they go into the next decade. And here we are. Uh, with Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, you know, as the world's most valuable companies, which is amazing, five tech companies, and they're all West Coast US companies to boot. Um, but I think it's an interesting question to ask whether which one of these companies might drop out first. Mm -hmm. And I think you already probably gave me your answer, but if you had to pick one that you would bet against because you think it was going to, you know, see a, a, a big loss of value first, which of the, uh, those four would you bet against? It really depends on how fast it happens. So I, I would probably bet against Apple, which is incredibly contrary. And at this point, Apple is the most valuable company on earth. Most people are on their knees bowing to Apple. But I think that it's not sustainable. We've passed peak mobile and that the innovation isn't happening so much. It's more innovation in terms of how can I force you to use more adapters so you have to buy more shit for your Mac as opposed to how can I make your experience better or create something new. Yes. Uh, Apple, would be, Apple would be my first pick, but I have, there's some interesting stuff in the book that I think all four have very serious challenges and very serious opportunities where they could become the winner, so to speak. Yes, well, that's, that, that book by itself sounds fascinating. It's a great time to be launching a book like that. Um, one of the things we did, and if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it, is uh, you know, we have our main title, Corporate Innovation in the Fifth Era, yours is Gods of the Valley, but we put all the names of the companies, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, in the subtitle. And what's very interesting about Amazon is people, if they search on the subtitle, on the names of the companies, the subtitle gets pulled up too, and your book shows up in the ranking. So, for example, if I if I did uh, God's Google Apple, and you've had those those words in your subtitle, it will pull your book to the top of the ranking. So, make sure the names of the four companies are on the front page and in the subtitle. Interesting. We have logos there, but that's a 
That's yeah. interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, you can't do a visual search on Amazon yet. Not uh, so. No, you need to, you need the subtitle. And it needs to include the four the four company names. Anyhow, enough of that. So we're very quick lightning round. I know we've already used up a lot of time, and uh, I think we've uh, covered off most of the topics that I wanted to cover off. But quick lightning round. Um, if you were going to bet a hundred thousand dollars on anything right now, what would you bet it on? Amazon. On Amazon. Um, if you were going to uh, do one thing with your wife this weekend, what would it be? I probably shouldn't say that. Go uh, go for a walk with uh, our son. Oh, you have a son. We didn't mm -hmm. get to that. OK, if there's one thing you want to make happen for your son as you look ahead, uh, you know, and as you think about his life into the future, what is it? To be smart enough and thoughtful enough to have a perspective where you're able to see other perspectives and think outside the box. I think there pretty much are no rules. Great. And um, you know, you, you spend your time doing a lot of things. You've lived in a lot of places. You've seen a lot of things. If there's one thing you don't spend enough time on, what is it? Happiness. Happiness. And uh, probably I should stop there, but I, I had one last question, which is obviously the question you always ask, which is, is there any question I didn't ask you that I should have asked? Other than why is my beard so incredibly sexy yet slightly uh, scruffy? No, I, uh, you don't shave much with a baby. No, there's uh, any question that you should have asked. Hmm. I don't have a good question at this point, other than why am I not drinking coffee? And the answer would be, I really need some coffee. OK. Well, thanks, Matt. It's been great getting to know you. I hope all of the audience has enjoyed it, too. Um, uh, you, you've got a great background as a blogger and a podcaster. Um, I'm sure many of the people who are listening to this are already on the syndicate list, if they're not. Uh, you're going to give them the domain name so that they know how to join the syndicate and see the great deals that you're putting up. Um, the book, Gods of the Valley, will be published any time. So we all want to hear more about that book once it does come out. And I'm certainly going to read it. And uh, I'm looking also uh, forward to seeing more of the companies that you are sharing with all of us and uh, always on the prowl and looking for good investment opportunities. So thank you very much and have a great weekend in Switzerland. Thank you as well, Matthew. You're a much better interviewer than I am. Don't say that. Don't say that. You have a British accent, so it all sounds better. Uh, no, only to Americans. Only to Americans, I know. Thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. Hopefully, this has been interesting. Thanks a ton to Matthew for volunteering and doing this. And hopefully, I haven't bored you all to death. Not at all. It was fascinating. Thank you very much, Matt. Bye. You guys know what to do. Go make it happen. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah,